So in the interoperative phase, I'm going to talk to you about regional versus John group. We have talked about restricted transfusion trigger, depth of anesthesia monitoring, although this should be, I think, will be an aspiration at the present moment because not everyone has this, not everyone does a best monitoring, but it is something we should be moving forward towards. Goal directed therapy, maintenance of homeostasis as well as prevention of uh, AKI or acute kidney injury and recognition of cement implantation syndrome. And the most important, I think, is continuous analgesia using multimodal approach and uh, opioid reduction or opioid free anesthesia. So <clears throat> let's come to the first thing. It's about regional versus John Lansdale. Now, I have not found anywhere in the literature which says regional is better than general or general is better than regional for fractional things. This was a Cochrane review which was done by Dwey et al. And it found that there was no difference in the outcome. It actually found that there was limited evidence to suggest that if you give ketamine anesthesia without neuromuscular blockade, it gives poor surgical results. And I think you might think, you know, ketamine increases the muscular tone in the muscle, so maybe it doesn't fix well. So if you use it without neuromuscular blocking, it can cause a problem. And the only other thing it showed that in patients who are undergoing spinal anesthetic, but they were not on thromboprophylaxis, it reduced the incidence of pulmonary embolisms or, or DVTs. But we know now that that is a no-no. There are hardly any hospitals now which do not practice thromboprophylaxis in post-surgical patients. Everyone has this. This meta-analysis or, or this uh, uh, Cochrane review had some of the data which goes back to almost 1977. So I think there might be a period there in the late 90s, especially in some countries where thromboprophylaxis were not routinely given. And hence we found that, okay, spinal in those cases when you don't give thromboprophylaxis may reduce the incidence of deep vein thrombosis. This is again uh, one of the latest papers I could find in difference between jungle and neuroaxial anesthesia for hip fracture patients. It's a systematic review and a meta analysis. This I think was published in 2017, it was done in 2016. It has some current studies. So if you look at the forest plot here, which says favors regional or favors jungle anesthetic, and this chart is of a 30 day mortality, you will find that is bang in middle. That means there is no difference. It does not favor uh, general anesthetic or it does not favor regional anesthesia when it comes to 30-day mortality. However, if you actually look at this slide, <coughs> it shows that if you look at length of hospital stay, regional anesthesia is associated with a reduction in length of stay as compared to general anesthetic. And then I looked at it more closely, read the paper more closely, and the authors have or actually said to be very fair that the reduction of stay was quarter of a day. Now that might be statistically significant, but is, is it clinically significant that you know you get quarter of a day more? Well, I mean, if you get it in times where you have to get your surgical admissions through in the morning, it might be significant. Otherwise, I don't think so. There's much significance in that. The other thing was that in hospital mortality, if you look at it, it favors regional anesthesia greatly, or you know, you can say that there is some amount of difference. But if you carefully look at all the studies, there are many studies here which has not shown to be a difference. But there's one study here which shows a difference. And if you look at the numbers, it's 52,000 patients. So this was an observational study from Chu et al. And they found that there was a reduction in mortality with regional anesthesia. So if you look at it, in this meta-analysis, there is only one, and this is what you have to be very careful when you look at forest plots, is what study is influencing that meta-analysis the greatest. And in this case, it was that study. And you have to remember that was a really huge number, but it was an observational study. So again, then you start wondering, if your in-hospital mortality is low, why is your 30-day mortality the same? So does it have any clinical significance that your patient is going to you know, have five-day mortality, which is improved, but dies at 30 days. So I, I really don't think so you can take this, uh, you, you can read a lot into this, but I think what is very significant is that between general anesthetic and between regional anesthesia, there is no difference at present. I am aware of a huge trial, a randomized controlled trial, which is going on at present. I think it will shed more light whether general anesthesia or regional anesthesia is more beneficial in these cases. 
depth of anesthesia is something which has picked up quite a lot. And I think if you look at this, what it shows is mortality is was reduced with higher viscose. What it says, what it means is that if you actually increase the depth of anesthesia, especially in elderly patients undergoing hip fractures, and this was just a sedation, this is not a journal anesthetic. So a lot of times you give spinal and you start sedation, you give a full TCI. If you get the this level lower, they it is associated with higher mortality. So nowadays the recommendation actually have this monitoring even if you're doing sedation, so you don't sedate them too much. If you look at the next slide, here, this is a Kaplan-Meier's uh, graph here, and it shows the proportion alike. This group is all patients, yeah? And this group is patients with Charlson's comorbidity index of greater than four. Uh, we use Charlson's comorbidity index to understand, uh, it, 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 it is made up of various parameters. Okay, and that means the patients have multiple comorbidities. If you look at all patients, you can see that there is still slight separation on the proportion who are alive, okay, till around 360 days, which is a year. But that is much greater at a year in patients who have multiple comorbidities, okay. In all patients, you'll see the benefit. By the end, it comes to two years in all patients is lost. Whereas in this group of patients, till around 1,800 days, which is around maybe five years, you will still see the effect going on, which means that if you have given a very deep anesthetic to an elderly patient, the chances that the patient will die, okay, in the next five years. His, his chance of dying is much, much more than any other patient whom you do not give uh, a deep anesthesia. And especially, this is very true in patients who have got multiple comorbidities. Now, this guided uh, anesthesia prevents delirium. So this is again something which is applicable not just to the fraction of femurs, but to all patients. That if you have any patient who is elderly and your depth of anesthesia is great, you, you have uh, delirium. So one of the most effective ways of preventing delirium is try to keep uh, the sedation light. Do not go to depth around 200 to 300. 20 or 30 on the best, because that's definitely going to cause more problems for these patients. Now, has anyone heard of infrastructure? So I think nowadays the bad word, or the buzzword is, is hypertension. Avoid hypertension in the elderly patients. Actually avoid hypertension in anyone. Uh, this was a study which was done where they actually used noradrenaline and they had two groups. One group which was a control group where they gave boluses of uh, vasopressor or ephedrine, I think. At the other group, they gave noradrenaline to keep the, uh, uh, the blood pressure fall to 10% of the baseline. And they actually found, and, and most of these patients, actually all these patients had some kind of kidney dysfunction. They, what they found in the result is, you could see that there was an improvement uh, in the renal dysfunction in the intervention group. Yeah, altered consciousness and hypoxemia was lower in the intervention group. So it shows that having blood pressure which is close to the baseline is very important for the geriatric population, especially when it comes to things like acute kidney injury. Now, you know there is an autoregulation curve. It's between 50 and 150 for young, healthy individuals. For the elderly population, this autoregulation curve moves to the right, which means that these patients do not tolerate hypertension as well as uh, the younger population. And again, this is what shows that, you know, with the standard treatment, uh, you have almost a 20% difference here, yeah, between uh, the chance of getting post-operative organ dysfunction as compared to uh, the individualized treatment group. This was another study which uh, was called uh, the uh, ASAP 2 study. It is a, it's actually an audit. It was an audit of 11,000 patients which was done in the United Kingdom. It showed that the risk of death increased as your blood pressure fell. The odds ratio was around 0.98 to 0.97 for every 5 millimeter drop in your systolic blood pressure and 1 millimeter mercury for your mean arterial pressure. And that directly impacted your 30 day mortality. If you actually start looking at that, if you are, you know, the moment your systolic pressure goes below 80, then 90, you'll see a huge spike here. So, you need to definitely avoid getting down to systolic blood pressures of 90 or below. And even in the mean arterial pressure, you'll see that for these patients, once you get somewhere around 75 to 70, you can see that the 
slope gets much, much higher. So your chances of mortality is much higher. There is a study which is actually going on where they have actually shown that if you have a patient and if you have three minutes of hypertension, which is continuous, or if you have 10 minutes of hypertension in total throughout the whole episode, you have a threefold increase of having cardiovascular as well as, as uh, renal dysfunction in the patient. So the mantra now is avoid hypertension. Please do not go to a mean arterial pressure less than 65 in the general population. And in the elderly population, you might have to keep your mean arterial pressure slightly higher than that. So the next trial was the relief trial. Uh, this trial used liberal as well as you know, restricted fluid therapy for these patients for major abdominal surgery. What they found was that there was no improvement in mortality and hospital stay in, in these patients. Increased incidence of acute kidney injury and surgical site infection, and they recommended using zero balance rather than restrictive approach. But there was a problem with the study. If you actually look at the study, the fluid restriction is either very low or the amount of fluid which they give is too much in the liberal strategy. There were some people who were participating in the liberal fluid therapy group of the study, and they were actually saying that you know we never use so much fluid normally. It's just because of this trial we are having to use so much of fluid. So what it proves is proves what we already know, that too much fluid is bad, patients go into pulmonary edema, too less fluid is bad too, because the patient go into AKR. But this was a study which was done in hip fracture patients specifically. It was the hip hop study. Uh, no, it wasn't for hip fracture, I'm sorry, it was for revision in hip arthroplasty. And they found that implementation of poor directed therapy was successful and associated with reduced surgical complications and in post structure bleeding as well as hospital and ICU stay. Now this is the graph that shows the safety. Now, just a word or two on cementary implantation syndrome. I mean, I think this is very, very important. This is a leading cause of mortality in these patients here. Uh, cementary implantation has to be recognized for you to treat it, okay? Is there any way of avoiding that? Of course, you can ensure that the patient's adequately hydrated. You know, you could be vigilant for cardiovascular events, once the femoral head is removed, confirm to the surgeon that you are aware of the preparation of the femoral canal, you aim to maintain the systolic blood pressure within 20% of the induction value, and this is very important. I think most of the cases what we tend to do is we give some metronomal. Uh, do you use metronomal? You use methylterin, is it? It's an alpha A1 space. Phenylephrine. So it's, it's similar to that. So you use that to reduce the fall of blood pressure in these cases. But I, one word of caution, in my personal experience, and I think I've noticed it with a lot of people, is pulmonary hypertension. If your patients have pulmonary hypertension, you do see a lot of people getting very severe reactions after cementing. And this is a group of patients, I actually insist my surgeons do not put cement. And I ask them to do uncemented any other process. So, you know, all these guidelines, I'm sure most of us are familiar with, but if you have a patient who has pulmonary hypertension, please be very wary of this condition. Okay, in the post-operative phase, I think the common things which we do, pain management and prevention of uh, delirium, early mobilization, early nutritional support, early rehab, fast-track concept, geriatric wards and centers, getting geriatricians to do the geriatric uh, uh, you know, management of these patients. I'm going to just talk about two, the pain management, you know, different places have different uh, strategies, but I think all, the major strategy should be to avoid opioids in this group of patients because they really don't do well. Avoid cyclizing and tremadol. These drugs can cause significant confusion in the elderly patients. Our protocol for fracture neck femur patients is fixation of fracture, which takes care of the pain, give them some IV paracetamol, intraoperative fascia in like a block, and we use PR and Oxinom for breakthrough pain. And in these patients, they don't tolerate NSAIDs very well because most of them already have some kidney dysfunction, and hence you should avoid uh, non-steroidal uh, analgesics in these patients. Preventing delirium. Now, there are a lot of methods uh, you, know, you can use which are very simple. Things like early mobilization, rehabilitation, and nutrition. I think having Analgesia is probably one of the most important things, yeah? Noise reduction, diagnose post-operative cognitive dysfunction, you know, rapid reorientation to the surrounding, 
Of course, if you need medications, you can use medications like haloperidol at a low dose, olanzapine, or things like clonidine. Last few slides. These are just, I, I think in anesthesia 2018, this was the first time there was ever an international consensus on how to manage hip fractures. We've had a lot of national guidelines with various countries having their national guidelines on how to manage hip fractures. This was one of the very few times everyone came together and they developed an international consensus here. So, I mean, it was, again, the same things we have talked about. You know, I'll just let you read for a minute. Like, surgery should be available, you know, operate within 48 hours of admission. Surgical list order should prioritize these patients. And, you know, evaluate, again, same very things we are talking about, frailty, cognitive status, and perioperative risk. Intraoperatively, either offer a general or a regional anesthetic, adjust their sedation and general anesthesia according to their age, frailty, and monitored brain activity. I think going forward, I think you will see multiple studies coming on this and avoidance of delirium with this. Give supplemental oxygen to all the patients. A lot of these patients, around 70 to 20 percent, have preoperative low saturations even before you go in for surgery. In which case, giving supplemental oxygen to these patients would be of great benefit. Consider invasive a blood pressure monitoring in the high risk group of patients. Protocolize and prevent, recognize and manage bone cement implantation syndrome and and standardize. I think standardizing anesthesia for this group of patients would be highly beneficial. Okay, so there's a little bit about post-operative uh, things there. Like one of the important things is critically care, critical care facilities should be routinely available. Now there's a big audit which is going on in uh, the UK about emergency laparotomies, and one of the things with that was that any patient who had a greater than five percent mortality risk we started putting them in intensive care. We started noticing that their uh, outcomes are better. So we are happy to actually take an 85-year-old into intensive care. Me being an intensivist, I'm guilty of that too. But when a 75-year-old fraction of femur comes, we just say, oh, no, this patient is not going to benefit from ICU. So I think it's, it's just a matter of us changing our thought there, saying that these patients probably need critical care facilities as much as laparotomies do. Okay. Maintain, you know, perioperatively protocolize the management of your uh, anticoagulants, you know, anemia, analgesia, pre-medication, and a few organizational research and training. I think every institute should have a look at these, uh, uh, at this publication, the guidelines. I think it is really good, and it has done, it's been done by uh, some really well-known uh, names there who have taken part in preparation of these guidelines. With that, I finished my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.